Well, good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to be in Revelations chapter 2. Don't get too excited because I'm not teaching on the end times. I've just taken a portion of this that I want to teach out of. So before I start, I just, I just want to share a little bit on my, uh, my stay here at Living Way. Um, I've been coming to Living Way um, since I was 19 years old. I'm 32 now, and I've experienced everything in this ministry. I've learned what it is to be a man while attending this church. And there are so many experiences that I've had here where I'm in charge of a ministry, and then I'm not in charge of a ministry. I am courting someone, and then I'm not courting somebody. And here I am, and I look back, and you know I'm married to my beautiful wife, Carmen. Uh, we just had or not just had, she's a, she's a year and eight months now, my daughter, Araya, and she's downstairs now. And when I begin to reflect on all of the time, you know, that I've been here, that I've, that I've been a believer, that I have been redeemed, I don't see perfection. I don't see uh, the perfect journey. What I see are many failures, but so much redemption. And tonight, what I really want to share is how we can so quickly overlook all of the things that God has done for us in the busyness of life. Even when we think we're doing well, even when we're in ministry and we're striving and you know everything on the surface level seems good, it is by the grace of God that God would expose or confront us, that he would teach us in those moments. Because we all know that you know, God chastises, he corrects those that he loves, those that he calls sons. And so in Revelations chapter 2, I, I want to start off in verse 2. And it says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. Above all else, it is God and God alone who knows all of our works. He knows all of our deeds. He knows the, the darkest parts in our hearts, as I'm sure you guys have all heard before. And this is what he's telling this church. And, it, and it, you know, it starts off well. He's talking about the things that they're doing. And, you know, they are, they are laboring for the kingdom of God. They are in ministry. And I want to make it clear that I'm not just speaking to the church as a whole, and, and neither is God speaking to the church as a whole. And what I mean by that is he's not clumping everyone together. When he's telling them, I know your works, he's speaking to each individual person, to the person in charge of a ministry, to those that are serving in the ministries. And, and as you guys know, every church has so many needs and so many reasons to have servants. There's the children's ministry. There's the usher's ministry. There's, you know, all of these, the cleaning of the church, um, the, the young adult ministry, the, the servants downstairs that serve on Tuesdays, as you guys hear about the needs of those. And there's all these people that allow the body of Christ to function, right? And every single one is important. And every single one is held accountable. You know, the, the ears, um, without the body, you know, the ears can't, or without the body, you can't hear without the ears and the nose and the eyes, as we see through Scripture, about the importance of every single position in the church, and so when God speaks and says, I know your works, he's not speaking as a whole of, oh, I know all of the outreaches that you do. He's speaking to the individual people saying, listen, I know how diligent you have been in all of these areas about how they have been laboring to do God's work, right? How they've been doing all these outreaches. And we have many, many, man, amazing ministries, not just in this church, but in the body of Christ. I mean, I, we showed up on a Saturday, some random Saturday because we were trying to kill time for a doctor's appointment, went to a park, and there was a church there doing this huge event for back to school. They were giving haircuts, they were playing games with kids, they were giving them pencils and notebooks, and it's just, I was like, dang, like I just accidentally, you know, came to this park, and it's a full-on, it looked like a carnival, like there were so many things happening, and, you know, there was some Christian music playing, and, you know, me and my wife were like, oh, wow, like, you know, the city's playing Christian music because <laughs> that's how big this operation was. And, you know, later on, we obviously, you know, someone started speaking and they were, they were starting their raffle and we realized that it was one of the local churches that was putting on this event. My point is, is that 
it's not just here, it's, it's in every community across the world that the gospel is being shared and that there are people diligently working, not just for people to hear the gospel, but for people to experience the love of Christ, for someone to gift them something, expecting nothing in return. And that's the gospel. That's what we receive from Jesus. We are gifted something in no way able to pay back. And this is what this church has been doing, their labor and also their endurance. And it's being a part of ministry for so long, it is the thing that challenges people the most, endurance. Because life can hit you in so many different ways. And to continue to serve God in not just your personal capacity, but in the fellowship, to continue to show up when you're scheduled to serve. And also on a personal level, despite what takes place in your life, to continue to honor God while being a father, uh, while being a husband, while being a brother, in all the capacities that we serve our families and our friends and our communities, to continually serve, expecting nothing, but, but only being refilled and refreshed by the gospel, by the scriptures. And so they were showing this great endurance in the midst of the city that was, well, financially thriving. There was so much happening there. There was, there was things that were part of that city that were considered the wonders of the world. And they were in the midst of all of the pagan worship. And they had these temples where, you know, they would go and worship these idols and they would do sexual acts to worship their gods. And so it wasn't just doing God's work, but it was also the endurance of temptation. And if we're going to, I guess, apply it to our lives, and I think that the, the, the ways we're tempted as believers is to be misleading and deceptive. It is the number one thing that we will all struggle with in our walk. Because I'm not going to sit here and be like, hey, you guys are going to go out and blatantly sin, but you will mislead yourself. You will mislead your own heart in thinking that, well, this won't cause me to sin. Or you'll be deceptive with one another about your, your secret sin, the thing that you struggle with most. You won't share with anybody. They'll ask you how you're doing, and you will mislead them. And that's why I highlighted the fact that it's God who says, I know your work. And they're coming against evil people as well. They are, they're standing firm for the gospel. And there's plenty of, of just believers, man, that stand firm for the gospel, that stand up against evil people. But also they are they're testing everything that they are taught. It's not the attendance, but all of these people in this church, they're, they're going home and they're reading the epistles. They're reading the letters that were sent to the churches. They're reading the gospels and the accounts of how Jesus died on the cross for their sins. And they're testing against all of these people that are seeking to profit off of the gospel people that are just really there to have a platform of authority. And we have those today as well, where it's, it's not simply just to share the gospel of Jesus and how you can be saved and, you know, be with Christ for eternity. No, there, there's something in it that they're gaining from it. And they'll teach you things that will, well, make you want to come back. They'll, they'll comfort you because the fear of you not returning. And there's mega churches out there that are, um, you know, naming and claim it and teaching the gospel in a way that, if you truly want it, God will give it to you. And so there's, there's all these twisted doctrines that were out there that can be damning. And when I mean damning, I mean sending people straight to hell. And this is why, you know, God is telling them like, man, I have seen how you have tested everyone. But not just that, that they found them to be liars. Meaning we're called to test everything that we're told. Not just outside, not just you know, where they're non-believers, you know, and it's, it's, it's always easy. It's like the first thing somebody says that's a, not a believer and they speak about life, in my mind, the challenge is, like, don't just automatically think they're dumb. You know, like, someone, someone loses somebody or there's a, a struggle in somebody's life, and if they're not a believer and they begin to speak, you're like, okay, whatever they say, it's going to be wrong. That's, that's the easy front to cover, right? You're just, you're prone as a believer, you're prone to not want to believe anything a non-believer says. But the struggle then becomes when a believer tells you something, and it just, it just seems right. When someone comes and confirms your desires in, a, in a, I guess, a Christian banner, you know, and you're asking everyone's opinion because you're getting mixed reviews because some say this, some say that, but 
it's like the, the number one thing, especially for our young adult ministry, is there are a lot of um, people seeking careers. There are people seeking love. And there's just a mixture of, of different things. There's, there's those that are already married, those that you know, are starting families. But the number one thing is that people come and they ask questions, but they're seeking answers that will, will strengthen their beliefs. And they'll, they'll ask you, like, hey, do you think this relationship is a good idea? And the question is more so of, like, you know, they just want me to say, like, yeah, it's, it's a good idea. And that's it. But to be tested, not only on the front of the non-believer, but to test everything in the spirit, meaning if you're coming to me asking me a question, I have to test it. Not according to my understanding, not according to my opinion. I have to test everything according to God's word. And why is that so important? Because now we get to the big one. I have to test everything that my heart tells me. When my heart tells me to fear, should I be fearful when, when I'm depressed and all of these things that we begin to speak into ourselves? I recently was teaching in 1 Samuel and how David said in his heart that Saul would kill him and it led him to leave the very land that God had promised him to be in. And we talked about the importance of what it is we speak to ourselves, but it's not just that. It's not just you guys being cautious of like, man, well, whatever I'm telling myself, it's important and I got to speak life to myself and I have to remind myself of the promises but it's to test the things you even tell yourself. And this is all the stuff that the church was doing. And like I said, man, there were you know, great ministries happening now. There was great ministries then. And there's also, man, amazing people who serve in churches. And in verse 3, he says, And I know that you have preserved and endured hardship for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary even against persecution because of what they believed and where they fellowshiped and what they represented. And even in the midst of all of that, you guys, they, they didn't quit. If we ended it there, this is, this is what all of us want. We all want to be that. You know, we, we all want that reputation. We all want that image of being somebody strong in the faith, of being called a healthy church. You know, you, when you tell people, like, you know, I, I attend Living Way, you want your church to have a good reputation, right? You know, you, know, you don't want people to be like, oh, you know, that church. You know, and the, there are those churches where people say they go there and, and everyone's thinking, like, oh, man, like, that's not, that's not the business. Like, they don't teach the word over there. And, you know, there's the, the Christian gossip in all the circles, in all of the communities. Well, this church had a great reputation, a great reputation before Everyone that observed them but God. And this is as, as damning as it is that God would confront them and begin to correct them. You have to understand that, that these are the moments we should all hope for. You should hope to be confronted by God. You shouldn't be fearful of being caught. You should be hoping and waiting for God to confront you. For God to reveal your sin. Because there are moments where you're just oblivious, but there's also just the hidden sin. And what's taking place here, and you know, I talked about how God isn't speaking as a whole, but individually to each and every person. He's now speaking again to every single person when he says, But, but I have this against you. Recognize that what God is saying, He's saying, all of the things I just mentioned to you, all of the works, the testing of of discovering false teachers and all of the great things that your community sees, all of those things are now void. They don't mean anything. All of the great ministry that they were doing means nothing because God has found sin in them. Now recognize this. All of the, the ministry that you do, all of the good deeds that you do, man, how, how hard you try, how much you endure, none of that justifies None of that redeems. None of that forgives you of sin. And it's why the cross is exalted so much. And this is what he's saying to them. He's saying, listen, but I have this against you. In spite of all that, there's sin and I must judge it. And he says, you have abandoned the love you had at first. This is, this is something that has always hit home for me personally because it's, it's like I, I told you guys, 
I've experienced a lot of different things while attending here at Living Way. And, you know, I have, I've been sat down for ministry because I disqualified myself. There are moments where I'm just on, I'm just being sick with it, you know, and, and I had to be addressed and corrected by God and go through a restoration process. And, you know, it took years. And sometimes they made me read the same book twice. And <laughs> I did all kinds of different things. And I was attending church service on Sundays and every three services I was here. And there was all of these things that were, I guess, in my mind being done so that I could be restored. But again, my focus was the work. This text is drawing all of us away from the work. God is separating two different things. God is separating the work and the condition of one's heart. There are two things that are happening. One's not important when it comes to God. So he says, you left your first love. The question always comes, well, where did it go wrong? What, what, what happened? But this is the grace of God, right? Because it is the spirit that convicts for a reason, and it's to bring us back. So when he tells them that they abandon the love, this isn't a mistake. There is no confusion. It, it is simply a statement that they decided to leave and leave their first love. Now, the problem I've always had with uh, different teachings is that there's a lot of uh, Christian lingo. You know, like they, they use these words and you're kind of like, oh, I don't really know what that means. And I, one of the famous ones is that when you're going through something and someone tells you, wait on the Lord, and, you know, you're being spiritual and you're just like, yeah, amen. And then you go home and you ask yourself, well, what does that really mean? What am I supposed to do? And so some people play it out in different ways. Some people, they just pray and they don't act. And some people go and they don't pray. They just act. And so there's all these different conclusions that people derive from that. So when I'm speaking to you on this, on this topic and about abandoning um, and leaving your first love, remember this, that when you abandon and leave your first love, it is because of the act of disobedience. I'm not talking about a feeling. I'm not talking about this, you know, this idea you have in your mind or, or how some people say they feel like they're in a, a dry season, right? We reference Israel and, you know, I'm in the desert right now. And, you know, perhaps there are, not perhaps, I know that there are spiritual battles that all of us go through. There is spiritual warfare. But this is not what I'm addressing. I'm not addressing the struggling believer. And this is not what the text is addressing. He's not addressing someone who just seems to be struggling, who has these doubts and needs to be encouraged. He's addressing a church that has decided by their disobedience to God, that they've decided to not obey God. And this is what it is. When we walk away from God, it is a decision that we disobey God. And it is broad because it's meant to be broad because God is speaking to the individuals. For all of us, it's different, man. And I can sit up here and I can, I can tell you all of, all of my disobedience, but they will differ from all of us in all of our circumstances. Just remember, when you disobey God is the moment you begin to walk away from God. And this is what he's speaking on when he tells them that you abandoned your first love. It's not, it's not this excitement that we have as believers when we first get saved. It is the, the biggest Christian joke, right? Where someone first gets saved and they're excited and they're, they're just doing backflips, right? And they want to serve in every way possible. And then there's those that have been serving for 20 plus years and they're looking at the, the new believer and they're just waiting for the moment the new believer gets burnt out. Because emotions and excitement, all of those things cannot be sustained. So this isn't what God is speaking about. He's not saying like, hey, you're not as excited as you first were. He's not telling you to, to be more excited when you're praying, or he's not telling you to do any of the things that were emotional. He's simply saying, in the beginning, you were obedient. In the beginning, you were willing to leave anything. You were Abraham, willing to sacrifice your son. That's what he's speaking about. That you left the moments in the beginning when you were, were you just able to give up all of it that you looked at your life and you recognized, man, this is, this is a life that is displeasing to God. And people have stories of throwing away all their CDs and you know, they, they cut off their friends and you know, everyone has their stories of how eager they were for their life to line up with scripture. That they could come to church knowing that they were being obedient to God. And this is where we find joy. 
And it's the reason why, you know, we'll, we'll go to that psalm later, but it's the reason why David, you know, when he's praying to be restored, he tells him to restore the joy of my salvation because it's in obedience with God that we experience those things. I was, I was at work one time and some guy walked up to me and he was not just some random guy. I'm kind of like throwing it off on that, but he was, uh, he's a coworker that works at one of the school sites, you know, and my job, I, I jump around from all the different sites. So, you know, he walks up to me one day and he goes, hey, um, he goes, you're a Christian, you're a believer, right? I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I believe. I'm a believer. And, you know, he says, what do I do to, to be happy? He's like, I'm not happy. I want to be happy. And, you know, it kind of threw me off. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, there's this lady and she's a believer here and she's always happy. She's always smiling, you know, and he's asking me. And at the time I was like 22 and I was depressed. So I was like, I don't know what's wrong with that lady. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's wrong with her. Man. But he's asking me this question on, on how to be, how to be happy. So, you know, my depressed self, I was like, I don't know how to tell this guy. He's being weird. This whole situation's weird. So I just told him the gospel. I said, you know, I don't know why this lady's always happy. And in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm dissecting. I'm like, this lady's a faker. Like, she smiles at work, and she goes home, and she got problems like the rest of us. But I was telling him just the simple gospel. I said, you look, man, the way you find happiness, the way you find joy, the way you find peace is simply by receiving Jesus, asking for forgiveness of your sin, receiving Jesus, and being obedient. That's it. And, you know, he obviously he wasn't satisfied with my answer and he walked away. And He's still not a believer. But <laughs> the point is, is everyone desires that. Everyone desires to have a joyful life, to, to have this peace, right? Or um, this joy that can't be taken. It, it can't be stripped away no matter what happens. And, you know, trials come and struggles come. But what we see through the text continually is that, the only ones who keep their joy, the only ones who stay intact, are the ones willing to obey unto death. That's it. I say it because I'm probably going to jump ahead in my notes. I always do. I jack up my notes every time. But when, when you look at Jesus in the garden, that is the picture of fulfillment. That is the model of of what it is to be obedient. Jesus displayed what joy, peace, and happiness are. And it was contrary to everything that, that we are born into because in our innate flesh, it's the complete opposite. We're born into sin. It is, you know, we are the prime example of the rich young ruler approaching Jesus like, hey, like, you know, what, what do I have to do? And Jesus is like, well, obey the laws. And he's like, oh, I've done that. Again, Jesus separates the work from the heart. And so he tells him, well, okay, now sell everything then. Realize that Jesus isn't, isn't changing the subject. He's challenging the rich young ruler on whether or not he truly has been obedient. If he's truly loved the Lord with all of his heart, that's really what the question is when he says, well, then sell everything and follow me. And, you know, we all know the story that the rich young ruler walks away. It was him being exposed to be a liar that he wasn't you know, willing to do what pleased the Lord, that he wasn't obedient in all the commandments. And, and this is what's happening here, and this is what I'm hoping you guys would, would challenge you, would challenge your life as you examine how you serve God. Not in the aspect of how well you serve, but in the aspect of how obedient are you truly being. And so as we continue on, you know, we have some examples of really the topic of, of what tonight is, and it's, it's to be in the midst of God working, yet to have no intimacy with God. After everything that you've seen and heard, and yet have nothing with him. Judas is a, a, a clear example of this, right? You... you you see so much and you read so much of the gospel of the healings and the miraculous things that Jesus did, profounding the wise. And yet, in spite of all that, Judas would do what he did. You have, you know, again, King David. Dude, he, he 
knocked Goliath unconscious with a stone, then walked over, took his, took his sword, and chopped his head off with it. No experience other than being a shepherd. And, you know, we, we see, you know, he does say, like, oh, I took out a lion, took out a bear. Like, I, I got down in the fields where no one saw. And he had the experience that God had prepared him for that. But my point is, is that God gave him one of the greatest victories on a battlefield, that he would be just a young boy. And he would still commit adultery, murder another man to steal his wife, and then not repent, and then have to come to a place where really is parallel to what's happening here in Revelation chapter 2. It is God confronting out of mercy and grace. And in the same way that David was in his sin, and you know, it was a miserable time as we read in the Psalms that his joy had been stripped, that his life had been flipped upside down because of his disobedience, that we see he was confronted and he was able to repent by the grace of God. But my point is, is that so much happened in King David's life where he saw God work and do amazing things. So much happened in Judas's life where he would witness everything that Jesus would do on earth. All of the disciples would run and flee after everything they witnessed and saw. My point is, is that because where you are, because of where you serve, it means nothing in your relationship with Jesus because you can be in the middle of it all and it not be a reflection of where your heart is. Hence the testing of everything everyone tells you by the accordance of scripture, by the accordance of God's word. And this is what's happening here is that this church, man, just seems so just on point. Like they were, they were doing everything right. They were in the midst of God's working, man, the midst of God's power and, and ministry, yet they didn't know God anymore. Imagine that. And for me, I'm not going to even say imagine that. It's because I, I live that. To be in a place, to be forgiven of my sins, to be redeemed, to be so eager to serve, to start serving the church, to start teaching the youth, to start doing all of these things. And then somehow along the way, one, one day I decide, you know what, I'm just, I have a desire and I'm going to disobey God. And then now arriving at a place where I'm still a part of this ministry that's thriving, yet my heart is so far from God. One, one, one guy put it, man, and it's in a, a commentary that I read about the tragedy of how a man can point so many people down a road that he's never traveled. And it's the reality of the gospel that so many of us can share the gospel, so many of us can tell people how great Jesus is, yet never truly know him. And this is, man, this is what's happening in the life of this church in you know, behind closed doors, their, their hearts are far from the Lord. And it's not, again, it, it, there's nothing to be confused about. And there's nothing to be fearful about because if there's disobedience in your life, you've walked away from the Lord. I remember there was a, there was a season of, like I said, I was depressed and confused all the time. And, and I'm always curious, like, man, God, am I right before you? Am I doing things right? And the reality is, is that sin brings confusion. Sin um, disrupts your relationship with God and understanding that when you become disconnected from the fellowship with God, everything goes haywire. Everything. Saul served as king. God brought great victories. We saw that Saul disobeyed God. And you fast forward and you now arrive at a place where he would, he would use a medium to conjure up Samuel. He would do the very thing that God told the nation of Israel in the book of um, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. He would tell them, like, yo, anybody who practices these things, I'll turn my face away from them. How do you arrive at that place of being so disobedient and so desperate? By walking away, yo. Yeah? That's it. By walking away, there's, there's nothing to be confused about. And, and, you know, with this church, they had walked away. And, you know, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't say specific what the church's sin was. They probably had many issues going on, many problems. But the reality is, is because God loved them so much, he was willing to yet still redeem. And this is our story. That in spite of your rebellion, you know, in spite of your disobedience, and I'm, I'm speaking after the fact, 
after redemption, after receiving salvation, after serving God and knowing him, he would still be merciful and yet redeem again. And this is what he's doing here. I want to read from, you know, Hebrews 12, and it's something I've said out loud already, but it's, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he punishes every son he receives. So in Revelation you know, chapter 2, and now we're in verse 5, it says, Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And this is the starting again. This is God giving them the opportunity to do it all over, man, because he, had, he has given them this gift, and it's simply through the cross. It's through Jesus that, man, that they're able to repent. They're able to come back and start over again. This makes it clear that all the ministry they were doing, that it was being done in vain. In spite of, I guess, and this is a big one. You know, it doesn't matter how hard you try. It does not matter how hard you try. People break down all the time. They're like, man, I've I, I've been trying so, so hard, so eagerly. And I have these, man, these young men that I speak with. And it's tough because they come to you and they tell you that they're, they're trying so hard. And I can vividly remember the place of attempting righteousness by myself. Attempting to practice righteousness by myself. Without redemption, your effort is fruitless. Your attempts are pointless. You have to arrive at a place in surrendering to Jesus and recognizing the cross. And it doesn't doesn't matter how long you've been serving the Lord. This is the whole point of what he's telling the church now. He's saying, yo, repent again. Do it again. It's a casting aside all the work you've been doing Because in reality, if you can recognize all and count all the things you've been doing for Christ, perhaps it's been all for the wrong reasons. Always be weary when someone approaches you and begins to explain to you how much they believe in Jesus by giving you the resume of everything they've done for Jesus. The work is irrelevant. And so when he tells them, man, like, if you don't do this, you're going to be removed. Remember that to be obedient is to be in fellowship with God. In order to be in fellowship with God, because God only mingles, God only fellowships with righteousness. Why? Because he's righteous, he's just, he's perfect. He doesn't mingle with darkness. Darkness has no place, right? So in order to fellowship with God, we first need to be sanctified. We first need to be cleansed. We first need to be forgiven. And so in God telling them to repent, to return to Jesus, it's the same thing in God telling them to return to fellowship, to return to speaking to him, seeking him, and trusting him. There is an intimacy when God speaks of repentance. When God says repent, and I believe that repentance has been, it's been dulled down. It's been, it's been mutilated in a way because when, when people tell you like, yo, repent, you automatically think about the signs you see on the stop signs, right? And there's this, there's this sense of hate behind it. And, you know, you're telling people to repent. And it's like this rebuke, this, this harshness about it. When in reality, every time we see repentance in scripture, we see that there's a gentleness about repentance. We see in the New Testament how we're taught to bring people back into the fellowship, how to do it with gentleness and kindness, how we're to bring them back to Christ in that fellowship with this, with this love. And this is, this is the very thing that's happening here when, when God is, is speaking to this church. I have a tendency to, to read scripture in a non-tender way. Like I read scripture and it's 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 harsh to me. 
You know, like I, I'm, I, at first glance when I read this, God's like, repent. And, and I think of this angry God in face of this church saying, listen, I'm sending you all to hell unless you decide not to. And, you know, maybe it's my upbringing. I don't know. Maybe not everyone's like that. But when I read it, it just, it's just always, it's stern, you know? I don't want to say God's a gangster, but you guys understand the term. Like, God don't play. He's, he's the father of righteousness for a reason. And when his judgment comes, there's no escape. Sodom and Gomorrah. No one escapes from God's judgment. And it's, it's righteousness. It's, it's fair. It's, it's good. And so when, when I first read this and I, and I look at it, I'm like, dang, man, they, they better get it right. But in reality, when God speaks to this church, he's encouraging them to return to fellowship. He's encouraging them to return in speaking with him, in trusting him. He, he wants to nurture the church. He wants to nurture the body of Christ. He wants to nurture us. It is, it is all of your desires fulfilled in God. All of the things you wish you could have are found in God, and the only, the only thing we need to do is to come to the cross. And I say that with intent because I don't want to simply lay it out blatantly and tell you that the only thing you need to do to return to fellowship with God is to be obedient. Because the reality is, is even if you're trying your best, it's, it's simply about the cross. It is the recognition of what Jesus has done on the cross. This moment of returning to your first love, it is, it is to be not only confronted with repentance, but it is to be reminded on how great that love is to be reminded of how we've been redeemed on what the price was just so that we could know him, just so that we could have an intimacy with him. And if you're following along of what I'm trying to tell you, then you see that the value and in intimacy with God far surpasses your work for God. So 1 John 1, 9. He tells them, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This means, this means so much in so many different ways to every single person. Because there are those who struggle to forgive themselves. There are those who, who struggle to find fault. <laughs> believe it or not. But no matter what the sin is, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter if it's murder, we see that it can be cleansed from us. It can be cleansed. Now, perhaps the first thing that comes to your mind is, man, I can, I can be forgiven so that I can, I can go to heaven, right? But take it in this context. You've been forgiven so that you could return to fellowship with God. Not then, but now. So that you could be equipped for what's taking place now. And that is the mercy, that is the grace of God. So when we talk about, you know, Jesus and how he, he, he set the model and it's through the forgiveness. And, it, you know, we always have to go back to the fact of, when Jesus was in the garden, he said something specific. He said, Father, if you are willing, you take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It is to be obedient in spite of whatever your desire is. And this, this, this goes deep for everybody, but... The thing that blew my mind when, when understanding that, when understanding that, that we are called to obey in spite of our desires, the thing that, that really sets it home for me is, well, I'm not going to say this is the one thing, but this is you know, one of the many things. It is how somebody can be attracted to the opposite sex and refrain from that and serve Jesus without the attraction ever going away. 
It is the alcoholic never ridding himself of the desire to drink, but choosing obedience instead. That is not taught enough. There is a misconception that he'll take the desire from you. And I'm sure we've heard it before that, you know, the desire would just go away on its own. And there's so many of us that have been waiting and like, okay, Lord, you take the desire away, whatever it is. But that's not the way it works. It's that God is so great that he can offer you something so much more for you to say, I choose to obey. We are talking about perfection, sinless, never knowing death, not deserving of death. Willing to still do the Father's will to die on the cross. That is the contrast that Jesus is setting before us. It is, despite whether or not you feel right about it, despite whether you feel righteous about it, choose to be obedient, and your joy will never be taken. The fellowship will never be lacking. And I think... I know for a fact, I should say, I know for a fact that it's easy for all of us to convince ourselves of the desire to be righteous in spite of whether or not scripture will support it or back it up. And that's why Jesus is the, is the prime example, man, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you consider righteous. What matters is what God considers to be righteous. There are, you know, there, there's a split on political views. There's a split on um, pro-life. And there's, there's a split on all these different agendas that we come across in society, right? And it has driven, you know, wedges in the church community. It has driven um, wedges in families. And there's, there's all these things we feel obligated to stand up for, right? If Scripture don't teach it, it ain't worth it. And more so, there always seems to be an underlining of when he tells the church to, you know, return to their first love, and you, you come across all of these, these things, you know, of what they're doing, you're like, dang, man, this, this all seems right, this all seems solid. There's always the conclusion of, well, if they're doing all these things, then they must not be doing it in love. And we all know that without love, we are what? We are sounding symbols. We are just making noise. It is pointless. It is useless. And this is, this is the easiest thing to do, is to be oblivious in your approach when it comes to God's work and ministry. It is to take for granted the people God has placed in your life. Take for granted the opportunities that have presented themselves. Me and my wife's life has been busy to say the least, man. We've, we've had, you know, anyone who has young kids, you understand the, the babysitter situation and all of these things that just happen and your health concerns. And, you know, a while back I got extremely sick and, um, you know, I'm used to being chunky. And so I, I was like 185 and I got sick and I dropped down to 155. And I went to the, a theme park to, to go for someone's birthday. And I walked up to one of my family members and they looked at me and I was like, hello. And they were like, oh, hey. And they kind of like gestured like, well, keep, keep moving. And it took them a while to recognize me. But my point being is this. In the busyness of all of that, I took for granted not only the ministry, but I took for granted the blessings that God had given me. And when I apply that, when if any of you apply that on how you could just take for granted the people that you physically see every day, it's so much easier to take for granted God, to take for granted the fellowship that he desires to have with you, all the things he desires to teach you, to sit in a church for so long and, and not know his word, to not know what he desires, to not know the integrity and character he wants you to have. My mom had, had a throat surgery last week, 
And I just had this fear that I was never going to hear her voice again. You know, I think our moms hold a special place. And the challenge was, do I fear to never hear his voice again? You know, everything that I have is because of him. I have been, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I've been the biggest screw up you could believe. Um, I have broken many hearts because of my failures in ministry. Um, I have failed as a brother. I failed in all these areas, and yet I still have. And it's by no effort of mine. But simply because I was confronted and I was lovingly asked to return to fellowship with God. And that's what he wants from all of us, man. That's what he, that's what he wants from you guys. I hate that every time they tell me to do this, I cry, but whatever. I'm just a crying teacher. I don't know what you call it. Uh, it's, it's like an ongoing joke because I don't, I don't cry in real life, you know? I don't cry that much in real life. So every time I think back, I'm like, man, like, when did I last cry? It's always in front of a bunch of people. It's like, holy smokes, pull it together. I want to end in Psalms 51. It is the great restoration, after a man had experienced so much in his life of being forgiven, he found himself in the darkest place he had ever been, out of fellowship with God, not knowing God anymore, and his bones aching. He was not only spiritually feeling it, not only feeling it in his mind, the absence of wisdom, the absence of discernment, the absence of clarity, but his body was hurting. He felt it in his bones. But because God is so loving and gracious, man. Verse one, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. And we know this is exactly what God did for David. David is mentioned, right? in the New Testament, and in the light in which David is mentioned is to be an example of what it is to love God, to return to God, to desire in the moment when faced with the decision. And I say it like that because you're all going to fail at some point or another, but when God is gracious enough to confront you, it is to love God enough to return to him. And that's what David did so well. And so his rebellion was blotted out. It was completely washed away. Verse 3, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me against you. You alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Repentance always, always begins with the acknowledgement of what your sin is. And it's perhaps the difficult part of it. The difficult part because we always want to say, hey, I stumbled. Hey, I messed up. But no one wants to just take full responsibility. You know, it's, it's, it seems to be a rare thing to, for someone to simply just say, hey, I have I failed as a father. Hey, I, I'm, I'm addicted to pornography. Hey, I, I, I not struggle. I give myself to lust. Hey, I, I give myself to alcohol. I'm an addict. Whatever you're addicted to, that's where repentance begins. 
don't fool yourself, man. Don't, don't think that when the church offers prayer that you can, you can hide without acknowledging God himself. That when God says, I know your word, God is telling you, I know what your sin is. And that's what I want you to turn from. That's what I want you to acknowledge. So when David talks about this evil that he's done, it is because he couldn't admit it to himself, so God had to send a prophet, right? And God confronted him with the sin specifically, pointing out that not only was David an adulteress, but that David was a murderer. And even David, you know, because of the, the story that, you know, the prophet would tell him, he even condemns his own actions. And it's with that recognition of what his sin was, recognition of what the evil that he had done that followed the repentance. Because he recognized, as he says in verse 6, that surely you desire integrity in the inner self. God don't care about what the image is. God doesn't care about solely your rep, your, you know, your rep or, or what people think of you. The first thing God cares about is the integrity that is within yourself that only you can account for. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. There is this, this profound belief and trust with David, and this is what sets him apart. This is what sets him apart from the average person, is that when he says, you know, purify me, and he talks about the washing, and he says, I will be. He doesn't say, you know, maybe you can. He says, I will be whiter than snow. He was able to move on because of how much he trusted God to forgive him. We have those relationships where you tell someone, you know, you do someone wrong, and you, you, you tell them, hey, you know, I apologize, and then you see them again, and there's always a waiting out period. Right? You want to see how they're going to react because you're not really sure if they've forgiven you. There's always a doubt. God does above and beyond to eliminate any doubt in your mind that he's forgiven you, that all your sin has been blotted out. And that's why he says it with such and conviction. And he says in verse, in verse 8, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. David was set apart by God. Therefore, David was never dependent on anyone else for the condition of his heart. You don't need someone else to forgive you for you to be forgiven by God. You don't need someone else to treat you right to know that you've been redeemed by God. And there, there are things that we can do to one another that the relationship will never be the same. I don't care how much you love Jesus. It just will never be the same. The temptation is to apply what we know about each other to God. To apply how I can forgive you to the same way on how God can forgive me. You are comparing Filthy rags to God. That's what he calls your works. Just filthy rags. In no way does our forgiveness compare to God's forgiveness. So in this verse, what David is describing is something that we could never perfect. Because to say that you guys have all forgotten the sin that's come against you would be a lie. There are things I remember when I was a kid. You know, sometimes I still see people and I'm like, man, forget that person. Can't stand them. There are things that you physically cannot forget. Yet God is perfect and righteous. And when he said that his son was good enough, and when Jesus said on the cross that it is finished, he is so righteous and good that when your sin is forgiven, it's forgiven and forgotten. And so what David is saying in these verses, to be washed, his, his guilt to be taken away, what David is saying, he's saying, God, make me like you. Allow me to forgive like you. 
And that's what everyone here, that's what all of our desires to be, to forgive like God. It'll never be perfect, you know. We're always going to practice and practice forgiveness until we reach, you know, the perfection that we'll find in the midst of God and in his presence. But David not only loved God, in his repentance he desired to be like God, to follow in God's footsteps. So when we repent, it's as follows. We recognize what our sin is when confronted with God, when confronted with with conviction and guilt. We recognize what it is. We receive forgiveness. And from that point on, we desire to be like him. That's true repentance. The fake repentance is to ask God for forgiveness and to return to the work we were doing, to just go back to whatever it is we're doing. You You don't desire to be like God. No, you just don't want the guilt. You just don't want the case against you. Perhaps this is why when I read, you know, chapter 2 in Revelations, I read it so harshly because there are those that will try to escape the judgment of God. But he makes it clear, without repentance, I'm going to remove you. You'll be removed. Just as sin is removed, so will you be removed. And with the same confidence that David has in the forgiveness, he has the same confidence in the judgment of God. I think all of that plays into why David loved God so much. Because he understood how righteous God could be. He was used by God to deliver righteousness physically. And because of his understanding of what righteousness was and how serious it was with God, he truly understood what repentance was meant to be. Because he knew the contrary. He knew the contrast to not being forgiven by God and knew that God loved him, man. So verse 11, he says, do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Because as we talked about before, your sin and God cannot mix. Your practicing of sin cannot mix if you're trying to fellowship with God. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit willing to do what man like do you hear what he's saying all of this is pointing to the same thing all of this is pointing is for david desiring to be like him man give me a willing spirit that in spite of what i desire and mind you he's he's the king of israel his temptations are not easily overcome like they're accessible He was easily given Bathsheba. He was easily in in idolatry. He was easily doing these things. And so when he tells him, he says, give me a willing spirit. It's a willing spirit to surrender his desires. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and the sinners will return to you. This is every pastor. This is every mother, every father, every teacher that when they're forgiven, they desire to teach. They desire to teach the rebellious. If you don't have a heart for the rebellious, then you've forgotten where you've come from. You've forgotten, as Paul would say, that he was the chief sinner. You've forgotten that you were once the chief sinner, that you were once just them. And if your whole desire is to be separated from the sinners and and not mingle with etc., but if that's your desire, then man, then perhaps you have left your first love because the king of Israel would desire to teach the unrighteous, the rebellious. Save me from the guilt of the bloodshed, God. God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing your righteousness. When you recognize and you've been forgiven and you believe you've been forgiven, the only response, the only response possible is praise. You don't, you don't recognize all that you've done, all that you're guilty for, be forgiven of all of it, and then just go about your business. No, there is just a burning desire to be grateful, to be grateful you've been forgiven, to love God so deeply because of all of the sin that you've been forgiven of, Perhaps the older love God more because they've experienced and been forgiven of more. 
and the young are ignorant and young and will continue to, well, mature. But a big part of maturity is being filled with gratitude, a genuine gratitude that, that you're able to start again. You don't want sacrifice or I would give it. You're not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humble heart, God. Anything you want, that's what, that's what David is saying. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered by your altar. I'm closing with this. I did, I did a lot of legwork to explain to you on how the works don't matter. But I don't want to leave you with that. I don't want you to leave here and be like, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. What I want to leave you with is, in your sin, works don't matter. In your rebellion, works don't matter. The condition of your heart will always remain above the work. When the heart is in line with God, when the heart is repentant and full of gratitude, the only response is praise. And everything that comes forth from that heart of gratitude, from the understanding of forgiveness, will withstand the test of time. It's those that labor for the Lord in that state. Those that are obedient in the Lord and are laboring, I'm telling you, their ministry, their work is different. It is different and it is set apart. You will always be able to tell those that are operating in the flesh. And here David is prepared for ministry. You see, the same journey that we, we've just gone through in this psalm is the same journey that every believer must go through in order to be prepared to minister, to serve. It is then that your works matter. Because you're no longer a, you know, just a, a sounding symbol. You are now doing ministry. You are now doing the work of the Lord in love and in gratitude because you could never forget what you've been forgiven of. You could never forget how you were able to start again. And it fills your life with, with joy, with peace, and it enables you to love God above anything else. Above your family, you love God. And to love others more than you love yourself. And that's ministry. Nothing more. That's ministry, to love others more than you love yourself. And God says that the rest fall in place. The tithes and the offerings and the serving downstairs, the rest fall in place when you can begin to love others more than you love yourself. And it's in repentance that you recognize, you recognize that others are deserving.